conversations in a few moments with other people. And so I want you to find other people instead of sitting by yourself. So um, these three people are going to be talking. So they might join a group, but they cannot be your group. Sorry. So, and can everybody just come a little before, you know, this is a workshop and not a big lecture or whatever. So move forward. Move forward and sit with two or three folks. It, it made sense earlier that Suji told you to find new people. I want you to find people that you will talk to. And that might mean strangers. When you're talking about uncomfortable things, sometimes you want a stranger and sometimes you don't. So find someone that you will talk to. You need three or four people together. I know it's a little awkward the way the chairs are. Most of the time, you're going to want to look forward. So if you can just make it work with turning. OK, so here's what's going to happen. We have three people. No, we're good. We're not going to sit up here on a panel. Thank you for offering. We're just going to have three people tell you a story of their experience. So one of the problems we have in understanding other cultures and just a typical put yourself in people's shoes, you know, we need to, we need to hear stories. So when you hear stories, you're like, oh, my gosh, you know, and you're just kind of flabbergasted. And that's one of the ways we learn how to do better. So um, it's going to be Suji and then Topher and then Fred, and they're going to tell you a story, and then I'll tell you what to do with that. Okay? Come on up, Suji. One story. Whoo. Okay. Hmm. All right. So I think for, you know, it's pretty, I would think it's pretty obvious I'm Asian, um, but most people kind of clump us all in together and assume that we're all Chinese, maybe. Or I've had people think I'm Japanese. And um, I think that what's really hard about that, if you know much about the history um, between Korea and Japan and, and China is that you never tell a Korean that they're Japanese. There's a lot of bad blood there. There's been some restoration that's happened, but even between North and South Korea, Korea we know that there's a lot of enmity there. And so to even clump us in together, and I'm, I'm not even telling my story yet, but you know, it, it's highly offensive. And one thing I'll say about, about Koreans, because we're such a homogeneous um, uh, country in South Korea is that we are honestly one of the most racist people that you will ever meet. There's a lot of fear and stereotypes that um, Koreans don't know about um, African American communities or East Indians or Native American or you know Latinos and there's there's a lot of um, you know prejudice that comes with that. And so when I as I grew up in um, Canada and, and my father who is a minister Who's, who loves Jesus, when I got to my teenage years and, you know, I started dating guys and my dad would always remind me, your blood is Korean. He would say, your blood is Korean. <laughs> and I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> what are you saying right now? I know my brother's Korean, I would say. And his accent, your blood is Korean. It's like, okay, obviously he wants me to marry a Korean. That's what he's trying to say is to find your kind here in Vancouver, Canada, and marry a Korean. So as, you know, as Kathy was talking about some of the biases and the stereotypes, you know, that Asians have, I mean, I, I'll be honest, I had a lot of fear about different people of different cultures, even though I had friends that were that way. And so a lot of the different stereotypes that people have about Asians are, they're all good at math, so can you please help me with my math homework? I'm like, oh, I will try, but I was in the same class with the same teacher as you, so we know about the same amount of math that, um, that she taught us. Um, you know, another stereotype is that we take a lot of pictures, and there are, there are a lot of tourists that come from Asia that take pictures, but uh, personally, I don't like taking a lot of pictures when I'm in, in the moment because I, for me, it feels like it takes away from me enjoying that moment. Um, and so I don't, I don't really take a lot of pictures, but if you want me to take a picture of you, I'm more than happy uh, to do that. And so I, you know, I remember some of the other questions people would ask me out of ignorance, like when you watch TV, can you see the corners of the TV? It's like, you know, I, I can see the, cor the corners. And it's one of those moments where you're like, are you 
are you joking right now? And they're being serious. And so, you know, there's, you know, all kinds of things like that um, that happen as I'm growing up and as, as people have this, this stereotype. Now, what's hard is that even in the culture in South Korea, they continue to perpetuate a lot of these stereo stereotypes. And even the Western influence that, um, you know, that has really been embraced by, by the South Koreans, it, it's hard. And I, and I was sharing with somebody earlier that, um, you know, the rate of plastic surgery in South Korea is one of the highest of any country. Um, they're, they're most well known for their eyelid surgeries where you can get your eyelids made bigger so that your eyes become wider um, and more beautiful and more westernized. And so a lot of the celebrities you'll see on Korean television, they do not look like traditional Koreans because they've had a lot of plastic surgery um, by the same doctor, which is why they all, truly Asians do start looking alike when they have the same plastic surgeon, they really do. And so that's you know one of the things that's been um, Hard to see that, you know, as a country, they've economically done amazing, um, but at the same time, they've lost some of their identity and they've lost some of the value because they've bought into the idea that the Western culture is better. So it's better for my skin to be lighter than for it to be darker or for my nose to be pointier and for my eyes to be bigger. And so kind of growing up um, with my feet in between both worlds and being the subject of, you know, bias and racism from both ends, you know, it's an interesting thing to navigate. And so I, I give praise and God to glory because, you know, when I started dating my husband, the funny thing is out of the three of us siblings, none of us married a Korean. First of all, we're living in, up in Canada, in America. There are Koreans there, but most of the people that we were interested in were not Korean. And so, you know, each one of us uh, married outside of, you know, our race, if you want to say. And um, I remember bringing my husband, how much, how much did you say? <laughs> I got to stop talking. I'll finish up with this story. When I brought my husband to meet my parents for the first time, and he wanted to wear this T-shirt, um, once again, remember, he was raised, you know, as a gangster in North Las Vegas. He wanted to wear a T-shirt of the Incredible Hulk, but the Hulk was dressed up like a gangster. So the Hulk, of course, had his bulging muscles, chains, you know, loose pants. And I was like, honey, I don't know if you want to wear that the first time you meet my dad. Like, maybe can I take you to JCPenney's and we'll buy, like, a navy blue striped polo shirt or something? Just for the first time you meet him. Then the next day, you know, you can be you. And so I had a lot of apprehension about what would my parents think because, you know, this, this was the only guy I ever brought home. I never brought home any of the other guys that I dated. And so I was bringing him home for the first time. And uh, when he came and my dad had scriptures written in Korean up on the, up on the um, walls. And um, as soon as my husband knew, you know, what the scripture reference was, he was able to quote, you know, that the scripture. And so my dad fell in love with my husband because, because he knew the Bible. Imagine that. Um, and then as soon as my mom made dinner for us and she had a huge feast, if you've ever seen a Korean drama, they, they eat a lot of food and she didn't know what he liked. So she made him salmon, chicken, beef, pork, soup, rice, noodles, she made a feast and he was a starving, you know, college student, so he ate it all. And so as soon as he ate all of her food, she fell in love with him. And so it was like all that fear and apprehension I had just washed away and they were so accepting of who he was and have loved, you know, loved him to this day as their own son. Um, but yeah, that's kind of five stories rolled into one. So. Hello, I'm Topher. Um, I'm a white man, so it's kind of odd that I would be sharing in this context. Um, maybe some of your stories is a little bit like mine. I grew up uh, in southern Illinois in a very small town, very white. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Greenville College, um, it's very close by. Um, and just to give you the context that, that I grew up in, in a town that you could live your whole life and really never have to engage a person of color. Um, all of my school teachers from preschool through high school were all white. Um, 
the shopkeepers, the coaches, everyone uh, is white for the most part. Um, there were people of color, but if you didn't want to, you didn't have to interact with them. Um, for the past 10 years, I've been living as a minority um, in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, I married a Dominican girl, uh, who some of you know, Vanilda. Um, and we are living basically as an extension of her father's ministry at Nueva Vida in Cleveland. And I am the only white person in a congregation of about uh, 300. Um, and so it's a very different experience for me. Um, and I, I tell those two things, my early context and then my current context, to say that I have lived a life of accommodation. Um, and as a white man, everything is accommodated for me. Um, growing up in that context, again, I, I didn't have to interact with, with any other, anyone else, person of color wise. Um, and when Vanilda and I first got married, we met at Greenville College, and so we lived in my hometown um, for a while after we were first married. And what Kathy said was so true that when someone tells you they are offended, believe them. Because when we were early married, living in Hillsboro, and my wife would tell me that something someone said offended her, I was very quick to say, no, that's not what they meant. You know, you're hearing them wrong or you're, you know, putting your own stereotypes on Southern white people uh, on them. And that was not great for my early, mar <laughs> early marriage. Um, had, I, had I just gone, you know, the, the company line and just married a, a nice white girl from Southern Illinois, I probably wouldn't have those extra uh, conflicts early in our marriage. But um, all that to say that we moved back to Cleveland and now things are being accommodated for me in a different way that when someone speaks of an offense from a white person, everyone is always very quick to say, but well, I'm not talking about you, you know, you're, you're one of the good ones. We know you're, you're Dominican, you know, they, they, they try and make me not white um, so that I can be part of them. Um, so all that to say that I am trying to find ways that I can put them at ease rather than them putting me at ease about my whiteness and that I'm a, one of the good ones and I'm okay and I'm not the one who's doing the offending, but I am because I'm, I'm, the, white per <laughs> I'm the white person. I'm part of the group that is, that is doing the offending. So that's my thing. Hello? My name is Fred Tenike, and as you guys can look around and see, there's not many of us in here that are, you know, bald. Um, thank you, Scott, for being supportive. Okay, so, so, so Kathy asked me to kind of come and talk about some experiences of uh, sort of having to deal with racism and such over the course uh, of my life, and I'm really not sure, quite sure when to tell these stories because there's, there's something from, from so many parts of my life. Um, I'll tell you my, uh, I'll quickly tell you some of my, my oldest memory, and I'll tell you my most recent memory. Uh, so my oldest memory is I was probably about 10 years old, and I was, you know, going to shovel, shovel snow, and we um, grew up in a predominantly white neighborhood. We, we are just outside of Washington, D.C., but if you know how Washington, D.C. is structured, uh, many of the African Americans moved out to the east, and they ended up in Prince George's County. My parents moved out to the, because of where they were from in D.C., northwest D.C., they moved out to the north, so we moved out to Montgomery County, Maryland. Um, so I was always one of the only one or two African Americans in my class, um, but I had, you know, I just, it was never really much of my childhood and school, I don't have really any school stories about dealing with races or anything. Um, but, 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 but one time, I was uh, probably about nine or ten years old, and, and we were going around the shovels, you know, I was going around and trying to make some money and shoveling sidewalks. I'd do the raking the leaves, we'd do all of this stuff, and this was one of my first times kind of really going out to do this. Um, and I was really young, and I went across, across the major, across the highway, 
to the neighborhood that was predominantly Jewish. We didn't know. It was just, you know, we just went over there because the nice houses were over there. So if you're going to make some money shoveling sidewalks, you go to those houses. And I go there, and an, and an elderly white woman answers the door, and I say, you know, hello, would you like me to shovel your sidewalk? And she says, well, hold on. Let me go ask my husband. She turned around. I don't remember his actual name, but I'm just going to guess. She says, um, uh, uh, Harold, there's this colored boy out here who wants to shovel our snow. And I remember just, I was like, colored? Nobody's ever called me colored before. So I just started walking away, and I was angry. I was so mad. And she kind of looks out the door. She says, uh, 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 don't you want to, don't you want to shovel the snow? And I was like, you know, I, I remember yelling something. I don't remember what it was. Something like, you know, I ain't colored, and I ain't, you know. And I, there's probably some other choice words that came out of my mouth, but I walked away. I was the bigger man, and I walked away. Came back later that night with a rock that went through their window. But that's, but I was at the, at the time, I was a, I wasn't, a, I wasn't saved back then. Um, so, um, my wife and I were moving to the, to be closer to the neighborhood where we had planted the church in 2005. So in 2006, we were looking to move and, and uh, we were going around to look at some rental properties and this realtor had met us at a house that she was uh, listing for rent. And, and as she, we get out of the car, so you got to understand something, my last name is Tenike. So when you see my name and on an email, you see my name on the top of a resume, I had plenty of job interviews. I didn't get plenty of jobs, but I always got a job interview. Uh, so we get out the car, and you could almost see the kind of shock on her face that here we are trying to rent this house in this white neighborhood. And, and the first thing she says, well, you know, one of the things about this house is that if you don't have a, you know, income of $100,000, then it's really no point in even looking at the house. So we just walked away. Um, my most recent, though, doesn't have to go back years. I can actually go back to last week. My golf partner is a free Methodist pastor in a predominantly white church, uh, you know, closer to, uh, you know, the, the area where I sort of live. But, you know, we became friends, and, and uh, he's, he is, uh, he is a, an avid Fox News watcher, but he is my friend. We go out and we play these golf tournaments and we go out to, uh, to Pennsylvania. I don't know why we always end up in Pennsylvania. We're in Maryland. We always drive out a couple hours away to go play in golf tournaments out there. And this was one of the tournaments that I go to that I've gotten accustomed to getting out. And you have 100-some people there to play golf and none of them are black. And so I'm like, okay, well, you know, I deal with this all the time. But, you know, you're only riding around with the people on your team and stuff and enjoying the day and all. We get to the second hole. And I'm taking a little while to get out of my cart because I don't, didn't finish getting my stuff together. So I'm grabbing my ball marker and make sure I have my divot repair tool. I'm, you know, just kind of getting my stuff together. The golfers might know what I'm talking about. I wasn't really ready. And, and uh, so I catch up to my group a little later. And one of the guys comes out of the group, somebody I have played golf with for the past four years. Um, we, you know, he's, he is a member of that church. And, uh, you know, I like him. And he says, oh, you just missed what I was telling them, you know, something just, I said something really kind of, you know, really something distasteful yesterday and all. And I was sitting there thinking, why are you telling me this? I, you know, and he says, you know, because, you know, we were eating dinner and, you know, I said something about the blacks. And I said, hold on. I said, you don't change the adjective into a noun now. And he says, well, you know how sometimes there are some people, you know, some, some black people that just don't make the whole race look bad or something. And I said, it's like that in every race. And my, my partner kind of came and stepped up, kind of said the same thing and all. But, um, but it's just the sort of, an, and it wasn't the first experience I had on that golf course. Because the second experience came when I got around, we got around to one particular hole where usually you don't see the other people. You just kind of, everybody is spread out. But it ended up, we ended up one hole that got backed up. So there were three different teams all waiting at the same hole. So you got six golf carts, about eight people or so, um, and or 12 people, and then somebody else was, there's a woman there that was kind of just, you know, there judging something, you know, it was one of these, whatever, you know, non-golfers. You, I know you play golf because you're nodding, but everybody else, I don't know if y'all know what I'm talking about, so I'm not even going to go into detail. But somebody says something about, oh, I remember, I got something on my phone, and I said, whoa, Antonio Brown is going to the Patriots. Oh, no, no, this is the time he got cut. I said, Antonio Brown got cut. 
And the girl who was sitting, a little late, young lady that was there, she was like, it's about time. You know, this is, we were near, we were in Pennsylvania, so these are all Pittsburgh Steelers fans. About time, you know, you know, I just wish they would just be quiet and just shut up and just play ball. And everybody's kind of in agreement kind of over there. And she says, and, and Colin Kaepernick is the worst of them. I said, wait, wait, what did Colin Kaepernick do that was so bad to offend you? And it begins this conversation, and here I am, 1 on 11, 12, trying to defend someone who was standing up just for right. It was just, but it was this, this idea of feeling in spaces where you're alone. And that's one of the things that, um, that, that, that is at least something you have to understand about uh, the stranger, is that the stranger a lot of times is reminded over and over and over again that they're a stranger. And for an African-American man, we need no other reminder that we're strangers than to be coming to a free Methodist event, whether it be our annual conference. And my annual conference, Acts 12, 24, I can go to our uh, mine conference, which is it's called something different in other places, right? Um, yeah, it's a regional type thing, but you kind of get there with all the other pastors again. And I can go to my mind conference and be the absolutely only African-American male in the place. I can come to my annual conference that I went to this summer and be one of about a dozen African-American men that are in the place. And so remember the strangers often reminded that they're a stranger. All right. So... This could play off of something they just said to you, um, and it's a little bit like the question we were talking about a moment ago, but I want you to talk with a few people. So a couple of you that came in late, find, get closer to somebody so you can have a conversation, three or four people. What do you wish would happen if this, if this situation happened to you? So I'm just going to leave that up there, find someone to, to talk to. So you can choose any of the